Hello, and welcome to another video in the Getting Started series with the Datastax distribution of Apache Cassandra, How to Build an Application. And in this video, we will be writing an application that can send requests to a DDAC cluster. The ability for an application to communicate with a Cassandra cluster will rely on a driver, and the language that you write code, to do so. Datastax has created and maintains a number of drivers written in different programming languages, from Java to C Sharp, C++, Python, Node.js, Ruby, and so forth. I first want to show you where you can find a list of these different drivers and their corresponding documentation. I'll start up a web browser to go to the development VM that was created with my DDAC cluster. You can find the URL for the development VM within the GCP Deployment Manager on the right-hand side of the DDAC deployment window. On the first tab here, what is DDAC, I'll click on the link DDAC on GCP documentation. Scroll down to the Section Topics area and click on the link Building an Application for the Datastax Distribution of Apache Cassandra on GCP. On this page, click on the link Drivers for Apache Cassandra. On this page, the first table lists all of the drivers. The leftmost column contains the DSC drivers and the middle column contains the Apache Cassandra drivers. Only the Cassandra open source drivers in the middle column will work with DDAC. From here, you can click on your driver of choice to go to the documentation. Now, I'll do a short coding demo to build an application using the Cassandra Java driver. Don't worry if Java is not your programming language of choice, the driver concepts that I'll be explaining are similar across all of the drivers. Once I've opened my IDE, I'll create a new Maven project for my killer video application. Since my palm.xml is already opened, I'll add the Cassandra Java driver to the dependencies needed for my application. I'll then create a new class file that will be where I write the code for my application. Connecting to a Cassandra cluster begins with creating a cluster object. This is generally the same across all of the various drivers, and we can add the information to the cluster object needed to connect to the cluster. We can also use the cluster object to retrieve metadata about the cluster itself if it is able to successfully connect. This metadata could be the cluster name, or a list of the nodes that make up the cluster, their IP address, current state, which is whether they're online or offline, and so forth. For Java, I'll use the cluster.builder helper class to build my cluster object. Here I'll add the contact point, which is the IP address of a node in my DDAC cluster. I'm using the public IP address of the node. If you do not turn on public IPs for your deployment, then you'll need to set the contact point to one of the internal IP addresses of a cluster node and run your application from your development VM. You can find the internal IP addresses of the cluster nodes in the Google Cloud Platform console. Use the hamburger menu in the top left of the console and select Compute Engine. Finally, I will call build, which will build a cluster with my specified contact point. There are a ton of other options you can set for the cluster, such as username and password, if the cluster has authentication turned on, default query options, the load balancing policy, and much more. The next step will be to create a session, which is when you use your cluster object to actually connect to the database. When this happens, a pool of connections is generally created and maintained to each node in the cluster. We instantiate the session object by calling the cluster's connect method. Here I can pass in a default key space that I want to use when executing statements, which will be killer video. Note that both the cluster and session should only be created once and used as often as needed. There is generally no need to create more than one instance of the cluster or session object, and doing so will create more connections and consume more resources, especially if you are not freeing up the previous objects. With my session object, I can now execute statements on the database using the session's execute method. I'll run a simple query to retrieve a row from the videos table. The return from the execute method will be a result set object, which contains the rows from my query result, if any. Since I'm only expecting one row in my result set, I can use the method 1 to retrieve my row object. I can then extract the column values for the row using various get methods. If I want to grab the value from the name column, for example, I'll use the getString method, 
since name is a text column. The method takes in an argument, which is the name for the column. You can see that I'm also printing this out so we can see the results when we run the application. The application prints out the name of the video that I queried, which is getting started, building an application. Let's try a slightly more complex query where we can expect multiple rows in the results. Here I'll be querying the latest videos column to return all of the videos for a certain date. Since it's possible to have more than one row, I'll need to iterate through each of the rows in the results set, which can be done with a for loop. Again, I'll print out the name of the video for each row. When I run the application, the executed query returns four results with the name of the videos printed out to the console. You saw that I typed in the column value directly in my query string, which is not a particularly secure thing to do. The driver does support the use of placeholders, so I can set that in my query string and then bind the value for the placeholder afterwards. There are two more objects I want to show, a simple statement and a prepared statement. A simple statement represents a query that can be executed using the session object. What's new about the simple statement is that it allows options to be set for how that particular statement will be executed. This includes the query fetch size, the consistency level, the paging state, and whether to execute the statement with tracing. Here I'm creating the simple statement with the previous query and using the object as the argument for the session execute method. The last object is the prepared statement, which is a very useful construct when a particular statement is executed many times in the application. The statement will be pre-compiled on the cluster, and only the bound values for the statements are sent by the driver when executing, rather than sending the entire statement itself each time you execute. Here I'll create a prepared statement, query2, which has a query with one placeholder. Note that the prepared statement itself is not executable, as it always needs to have the bind method called. The bind method returns a bound statement, which can then be passed to the session execute method. I did not show any examples of an insert, update, or delete here, but they all execute just like a query. A result set is returned, but you generally do not need to process it. Any errors with a write request will usually manifest as an exception instead. That's pretty much it for the driver. The basic steps are to create the cluster in session, and then use the session to execute statements, which returns a result set, and then iterate through that as needed. You saw me typing it earlier, but once the application is done, it should close the session and cluster object to close the node connections and free up resources. We have barely scratched the surface of the capabilities of the Cassandra driver, but I hope you have enough now to get started. If you're interested in learning more, check out the documentation for the drivers. There are a lot of great features like asynchronous execution, load balancing, and much more. I'd also like to point you to the Killer Video Reference app, which can be found on GitHub. Here you can find the finished version of Killer Video with implementations in Java, Node.js, and c -sharp. And as always, check out Datastax Academy for free courses, blog posts, and even a podcast for all things Cassandra related.